Ooh. Thank you, Ben, for leading us in worship through the music. Now, tell you what, Scott, you may have to wait a while. They've got me wound up. I may just preach. Woo! Love that. So good to see each of you tonight for the second uh, service of our camp meeting. And we're so delighted to have Scott Mendes with us to share what uh, God is doing in his life and to share the Word of God with us and pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts tonight. If you were not here this morning, did not get to meet Scott, I hope you would get to meet him before you leave tonight. Um, Scott has a tremendous ministry among the Western Heritage people, the rodeo people, 1997 world champion bull rider. And he doesn't even claim that too much, I don't think. But I tell you what, uh, uh, I, I would be, I think. But anyway, good to have Justin with him. Justin rides bareback horses, recovering now with a shoulder injury. So he's out for this season. But uh, get to know these guys. Is that good? Ooh, there we go. I thought I might have killed it this morning, you know. <laughs> Praise God. Well, good to be in the house of the Lord again. Thank each and every one of you for your hospitality and the wonderful food. We may have to go back to Texas, Justin. We'll put on too much weight here. <laughs> God is good. Everybody have a good day of rest. Awesome. Well, uh, I tell you, when you talk about a camp meeting, and I guess uh, I'm a little old-fashioned because I really believe in, in, in camp meetings and revivals, and I know that God is uh, well-pleased as we come together and we congregate and we break bread and just uh, spend time with each other and learn about where we're at and some of the things that we can pray uh, over. It's been a blessing just a short time that we've been here. We've got tonight's service and another service tomorrow. So thank you guys so much for welcoming us and loving on us. And we pray that God's word would love on you as well. Let's pray tonight. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father, for your word. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in these times that we live in. Lord, although they're challenging, Lord, you're always with us, Lord, through thick and thin, and you're never going to leave us nor forsake us. And Father, I pray tonight that the reading of your word would just penetrate our hearts and bring forth transformation, Lord, that we would be in right standing and in covenant with you, Father God. We love you, and we just thank you for this time. May you be exalted and highly lifted up above all things. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Praise God. Well, I, I, <clears throat> I wanted to say this. Uh, this morning, we didn't have any products out. There's some out there. They look real fancy, but there's really only one product over $10. There's a lot of teaching, and I encourage you, as we talked about a little bit this morning, to be able to you know, re renew our minds to God's Word. We've got to replace some of the things that we've been putting in. And the way that we do that is, is through media and the reading of the Word and watching uh, great films and just being involved in the things of God. Because I'm here to tell you, if the enemy is a liar and he's a thief and the father of all lies, he's also a counterfeit. And he can only pervert and twist and distort and delay but God knows exactly where we are and what we need, and God's going to deliver that to our life as we trust him. What is true faith? You know, the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, but it's, it's not, I know our human nature, we want to say, when it's ready, I'll step into it and I'll walk in it. And God says, that, what, what would you need me for? So we need to learn how to have total dependency upon him. If you were here, how many were here this morning? Quite a few of you, amen? I knew we had the whole town out here this morning. We had a great return. Thank you guys for coming back. Um, I shared a little bit of my testimony. I just wanted to say I forgot the big, biggest part was right after my friend's death, I met my wife at my friend's funeral. We've been married 23 years. I have three children. We homeschool, and life is a blessing. Um, again, I go through challenges, and I just want to encourage you uh, to, to stay the course with God and continue to grow spiritually. My wife has just uh, been a tremendous in, root, in, in grounding me, my faith, our family. And so the Bible says, he that finds a wife finds a good thing. Amen? And there's a, there's a decent order to the things that God wants to do in our life. And so I share tonight. It was really hard for me what I would share tonight as opposed to tomorrow night because it's really good. And I pray that you even keep coming back tomorrow night. But 
I talked a lot this morning about the heart and about the renewing of the mind, but I want to talk to us about our heart because that's exactly the way stages came to me. Um, I thought I knew the Lord, but I was deceived. I wanted the Lord's blessing, but I didn't want to labor in the works that it would take to, to get into his presence. And it takes a lot of effort to lay down the things of the world. The, the world is a facade. Everything out there looks like beauty and cars and money. And, you know, if it was all so beautiful, then why are the people in Hollywood that have all those things sticking needles in their arm and cutting their wrist and not happy at the end of the day of their fifth and sixth award and championship? And Justin and I have talked about that a lot too. You know, they gave us our buckles and it's like, it still felt the same the next morning if you weren't complete with your relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. So if we're in here tonight and we're straining and we're striving and we're trying to earn God's love, you can only receive God's love through true faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. And for me, my heart was confused. And once I recognized that the enemy had me a lot of times confused and, and lied to me and had me on his playing field, I began to understand how to battle. And I believe that every one of us in here, if you're a Christian, you have a big bullseye on your chest. And the enemy is coming to knock us off course with what God's will is in our life. And so the heart is very, very valuable. And I just want to share a few things with you tonight. I do want to turn to some scriptures. If you don't have your Bible, maybe try to get the tape or um, write some of these things down because these are some things that really um, help me in my walk with God. And I want to make sure that as we uh, go from here tonight that you guys would have some spiritual things to really help you uh, in your walk with Jesus Christ as well. Amen. I'm going to turn this little timer on here because in Texas, if you preach too long, you know, they, uh, they just throw you off a cliff. And this thing won't go to a voice recorder because it's not picking up the internet. Anyway, somebody raise your hand at 30 or 40 minutes. Can I have that long? Amen. <clears throat> I want to read this. Ezekiel chapter 36 and 26 says this. I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. He says here, um, a beating heart in the si is a sign of life. Physically, your heart beats regularly, but spiritually, until you know God firsthand, your heart is flatlining. God promised the prophet Ezekiel, among all, all everyone else who is, chooses to follow God, the ultimate heart transplant, replacing stone uh, with flesh. The flesh is, is humanity and God originally, as God originally created it, which is more than simply being human. It is the promise of being fully alive. There's that word again. I told you that this morning. I believe that God wants to stir us up in our spirit and to be moving with him. You know, the easiest target for the hunters in here is anything that's sitting still. And the enemy wants to immobilize us. But when we're moving out in the things of God, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. Amen? So in the promises of being fully alive, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, in both this life and the next, the people of Israel believe that a person's heart reveals who a person really is. The heart cannot put on airs or something that it is not. It is an emotional and spiritual center of every individual. When God's Spirit becomes the center of people's lives, the Bible says that they are born again. Along with a new heart comes a new start. However, this heart transplant is possibly only through the power of God's Spirit in trying to become more loving and generous and kind-hearted through self-efforts can only bring a heart of stone to, cannot bring a heart, never bring a heart of stone to life. Only God's gift of His presence can jumpstart a heart into a permanent change. God's Spirit is at work in you and enables you to hear God's voice as He guides your decisions uh, to see His hand as He moved through circumstances to fulfill His plans for you to become the person that He created. Through God's Word to Ezekiel, you are given a beautiful metaphor to help you understand what happens when God's Spirit comes into your life and you are fully alive for every, uh, for the very first time. That's an awesome thing because I can remember when the first time is that I, you know, heard God and I discerned Him for myself. I believe that my 
first half of my rodeo career was I was dependent upon my grandmother's and mother's prayers. And there comes a time in my life when each one of us have to give account for every idle word that we speak. And so living on my mother's prayers, or maybe somebody in here is doing that today, that's not good enough because you have to come face to face with your Creator. And, and as you get real with Him, He gets real with you. Amen? And so that, that, in some ways, I believe was some of my problems as well in my life. And so the heart is uh, very, very powerful. Hebrews 4.12 says this, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joint and of marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intent of the heart. Amen. I believe that God knows what's in our heart right now, and only the human nature that is unaccountable and undisciplined would try to keep that from him and to hide that. You see, I could kind of buffalo all the guys around me that I was a good guy or that I was trying to be a Christian, but at the end of the day, I was a hypocrite because I was sinning and I was walking in a way that was contrary to the way that God wanted me to live in my life. And so trying to do all those things just made me a hypocrite. And I told my friends when we were leaving town, hungover and celebrating and victories and defeat was the fact that I felt God's hand on my life and I knew that he wanted a relationship with me. And he was ready when I was ready, but it just took me and my own stupidity and hard-headedness a lot longer to come to him than him to come to me. And I believe that God is knocking at the door of our heart tonight. And he tells us, I know what's on the inside. The more we try to facade it and hide it from him and push him away from it, the longer that it will be before we walk in total freedom and, and in blessings in our life. And so we'll get real with God. Some of my notes here talks about what is being redeemed from the curse. Let me just read this because when we look in our heart and we see the results of the things that we have, uh, the curse is this. It says, I never seem to have enough. It seems like I just live from paycheck to paycheck. I know God loves me, but why do bad things keep happening to me? I can't seem to make ends meet. Why are my kids such a challenge? Why do things seem to get uh, never seem to get better, and I can't seem to shake off of this sickness. We've all been there. We know that when we're trying to advance our walk with God, the enemy is there quickly to bring distractions, to bring delay. My wife and I have this joke because it seems like every time a, a washing machine, a refrigerator, a flat tire, something may happen, and, and, it, and it's just odd that it would come at that time when we're trying to do something for the kingdom of God. And so as we advance the kingdom of God, the enemy is very quick, and he wants to stop that advancement. And again, as I said this morning, he's not uh, uh, too concerned with you going or being something where there's no power. He wants to keep us weak and defeated, but God wants to keep us alive and activated and growing spiritually and knowing those things in our life. Amen? Listen to this. There's three types of three types of people here. There's the natural man, there's a spiritual man, and there's a fleshly man. We're going to go back to the heart in a minute, but I just want to be led of the Lord to share these things with you because when I was rodeoing, I didn't know why I didn't have the courage. I thought I was pretty tough. Why I didn't have the courage to overcome certain situations? Why would I find myself at a tailgate party when I really didn't want to be there? And Paul said it very well in Romans. He said, there's a, new sin, there's a new member in my body, sin, and it shows up, and it's predictable. And so those things in, in my life, I didn't have the character to overcome them. And I want to share some things that, that helped you. So once I realized that there was, there was two of me, there was Scott in the spirit, and then there was Scott in the flesh. But th this reads this way. The natural man is everyone who has not accepted Christ as a Savior is in this category. Many are in this group, and they are capable, capable of good deeds, but since their sin remains unforgiven, they are separate from, separated from the Lord because the Holy Spirit does not dwell within them. They cannot understand the things of God. And that was a scripture I wanted to read in 2 Corinthians. It simply says that the carnal man cannot perceive or receive the things of God because it's foolishness to them, nor does he, is he able to discern them. And so we want to be led of God's Spirit. Uh, the spiritual man is another type of man, and this group is composed of Christians who are filled with the Spirit and are surrendered to His control. 
and though they do though and though they are not perfect they are quick to recognize transgressions and to confess their sins um, and generally repent to turn back to God because the Spirit is ruling in their lives. He is then able to guide them, offering them wisdom and insight to the things, the spiritual things. And lastly, there's a fleshly man. Uh, this describes the believer who is trying to live in two different worlds. And I just want to say that the Bible says this, that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways and that he should not expect or believe that he would receive anything from God. Christians are given a new nature, but the old flesh patterns aren't, uh, aren't removed. But by allowing uh, uh, residual sins and tendencies to dominate in their lives, these people quench the spirit within them. And so I believe that we all in here can be in one of those categories or maybe a couple at different times or different seasons in our life. And for me, I really didn't like it when I realized the enemy was self-defeating me by my own self-destruction. I used to say it jokingly, I don't want to allow the enemy to have time to go play golf at my expense. And as you get in ministry, you begin to grow in the Word and you begin to recognize the spiritual battle in Ephesians 6, I quoted it this morning, but in Ephesians 6, it talks about we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principality, wickedness, and high places. Amen? And so we know there's a fight. And my word to you today is as we rise up in our faith, we get in a covenant with our living God, we begin to develop a new image, and we see ourselves as God's children. We begin to fight, and we fight with purpose. And then we begin to see the victory that we all long for. I promise you there's other things to do tonight than to come to this church and listen to a bull rider if you didn't really want to grow in your relationship with God. And I commend you on being here individually, as families, wherever you are today. God is ready to do miraculous things for you. And we have to believe that he can do them and believe that he wants to do them for you. Amen. I believe we read his word all the time and we just say, man, that's awesome. He did that for Moses and Ezekiel and Abraham, but why isn't he doing that for me in my life? I learned a long time ago two things. There is a God and secondly, I'm not him. Amen. He knows how to run the universe. And when we tap into him through our lives, he can be reflected to many others. We are all witnesses, witnessing tools in here. And it's good to have our witness match our character. God dealt with me so hard in my character. And I believe that he wants to deal with every Christian in their character. Doing what is right when nobody's watching. Because God is in all places at all times. He sees that. And he certainly is a loving father. He sees us in our pain and in those places where we need uh, other things as well. God is good. The heart is a spiritual womb. Matthew 12, 35 says this, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. Matthew 15, 8 through 20 says this, It says, These people draw near to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And notice, this is talking to the heart tonight multiple scriptures are uh, in the Word of God about the heart and about the mind and when you when you understand how he wired us it begins to make sense you see the flesh is the five senses it's the sight the smell the taste the hear the feel and the enemy knows how man is wired and so the enemy trips us up by putting things in front of us to distract us or to kill us because he comes to kill and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and to have it more abundantly. So when we recognize and cooperate with the way God designed us, now we're in the fight and we know how to win. And so I want to encourage us to, to listen to these scriptures about the heart. But in vain they worship uh, teachings and doctrines and commandments of men. He says, and he called the crowd and said to him, hear and understand not that, which goes, not that which goes into a man is what defiles him, but that which comes out of the mouth is what defiles that man. We go on into other stuff, but he goes on down to verse 19, and he says this. For time, I'll read 19. He says, For out of the heart 
comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, and blasphemes. These are the things which defile a man, but the things which he eats or has unclean hands, those things pass through him. And so the scripture a lot of times is talking from the spiritual windows of our life. But when we go to it, we read to it into the natural, and we want it to be done the way we want it done when we want it done. And so it's always good to determine who's speaking to you, what is the undefiled truth and the Word of God, so that we can begin to implement that into our daily lives and to recognize that and call a duck what a duck is. Amen? And to get firm with our faith. Because we've got to know the Word of God. The Word of God is quicker and sharper than any two-edged sword. It is, our, it is what we stand against the enemy on. Amen? A couple more. Uh, Luke 21 through 29 says this, And he spoke a parable to them. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. Uh, verse 21 and uh, verse 30 says this of Luke. Now when the uh, sprout the leaves see it, you will know that its summer has come near. So also when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I say to you, this generation shall not pass away until these things are fulfilled. The heavens and the earth shall pass away, but my words, the word of God, shall not pass away. And take heed to yourself, lest your hearts be weighed down with headaches and drinking and anxieties for this life, and that that day shall come suddenly upon you. Again and again and again, I believe God is saying are you ready and are we in a position uh, to hear from our Heavenly Father? Folks, I know there's a lot, a lot of teaching out there sometimes about certain things of the Word of God, but we need to hear those things. Many times they're elementary things that we've forgotten about and we get busy. We begin performing and we begin doing these things. And, and sometimes we look back and we say we forgot some simple little thing in our life. But remember, God loves you. And so I love the fact about the heart. You see, the condition of our heart is the controlling factor and the, con uh, the controlling factor and the condition of our life. This is both true physically and spiritually. A lot of times in athletics, you hear an athlete, you'll say, that person has an incredible heart and he's never giving up. But again, that's talking about the physical organ that is pumping blood through our body. God is talking about where is your spiritual heart and what is the highest priority? What do we give place to? Whatever we give our attention to will be those things that, that grow in our life. And so we must be not worrying and not fretting and not speaking contrary to God's word in our life because then we just nullify the effects and the power of God's word. The tradition of man is the only thing that I can find in that Bible that will stop God from doing miracles. And so we shouldn't add to the word or take away from the word. It says that in Revelation. And so it's important to take it at face value. And if it says it in the word of God, I have to believe it the way it is. I can't take a piece of this word out of it and say, I like this piece, but I don't like that piece. Amen? And we do that. That's our nature. We've all done that. The world is constantly reaching for your heart, and the enemy wants to fill your heart with things like... Lust, power, material thing, compromising beliefs, thoughts and attitude, confusions and distractions. The desires of the flesh will draw you towards the things that will fill your heart with negativity. James 1 says it this way. Let no one bring tempt, uh, being tempted say that I am tempted for God, for God cannot be tempted. Nor does he tempt anyone, but each one of us is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust. And, and, and seduce them. And then when lust has conceived itself, it brings forth sin. And then when sin is fully formed, it brings forth death. That scripture tells me that there's a process and there's a time. There's a recognition and then there's a, a work of it. But the ultimate end of it would be death. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That is our goal, that we would go to heaven to be with our Creator and our Father but we shouldn't get off the boat whenever we answer the altar call. That's just when the journey begins. I believe a lot of us uh, uh, approach that moment in our life as fire insurance. We say, I answered an altar call. I'm saved. I'm now going to heaven. And then we just live. 
neither good nor bad. The Bible says, I would rather you be hot, uh, but don't be lukewarm. Because if you're lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. You were useless to the kingdom. The Bible says the man that puts his hand to the plow and looks back, he's unworthy and unfit for the kingdom as well too. So this whole thing about spiritual warfare, denying our flesh and recognizing what's in our heart and what the world is trying to put in our heart rather than what God designed to be in our heart. That heart is complete when we have Jesus Christ in the Jesus hole. Amen. That's the only thing that will fit in there. Not accomplishments, not money, not wealth and status quo, accolades. Those things don't make us happy. The thing that makes us happy is when we lay our head down at night and we know that we have walked in our Father's will and we have done what He has called us to do. And if He was to come back that moment, we would be saddled up and ready to ride with Him. Amen. So it's about our hearts. We're drawn away how? By our own lust and our own desires. When I was rodeoing, you know, I wanted this. I thought I needed to have this. That was the lie that I took was I had to be a world champion before anybody would see the Jesus that was in me. The problem was it shut down my witness and I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't a witness for Christ even though I had it in my heart. So it made me double-minded, lukewarm, and I was trying to walk one foot in the world over here, trying to walk one foot in God's kingdom, it doesn't work. That brings confusion. Even at 18 years old, I had a nervous breakdown, and, and it was simply I was, had so much pressure from my dysfunctional childhood and all the pressures of trying to do things like win titles and stuff like that, and my body finally gave out. But then I met Jesus, and Jesus gave me a new heart. As we read in Ezekiel, he gave me a fleshly heart, a compassionate heart. He made me to discern the things that the enemy was trying to do in my life and how the enemy was trying to steal those things from me. What you give your time and attention to will decide what to fill your heart with. Amen? So let's fill it with good things in our life. Let me go on here. Here's some things that we typically fill our heart with in today's society and, and times that we live in. TV and radio, newspaper, magazine, books, movies, all kinds of drugs and beer and wine and food, cigarettes and sports and soap operas and all kinds of recreational things that we do. When those things have a higher place in our heart, what is the end result of that? being caught unready for when your father returns if you're not in standing with him. God wants to be in standing, right standing with you tonight and every day of your life. But sometimes we have some unfinished business that we need to ask for forgiveness and to repent. To repent means to change the way that we think, to turn from those wicked ways and to walk in the things of God with his grace and his mercies to help us through those things. Amen. How much time do we do in these following things? Do we pray? Do we read our Bible? Do we go to church? Do we have Christian fellowship, family planning, life planning, uh, relationships, building up our spouse and our children? My son, listen to my words, Proverbs 4.20. Uh, bow, your, bow your ears to my sayings. Let, me, let them not depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. There's the heart. God is telling us to put our, his word in our heart. The human heart is the fertile so soil that will produce what the seed is that we put in. You put God's word in our heart and it produced victory in our life. The Bible says that every seed will produce after its own kind. And so if we want to listen to the media of the world and we put that kind of seed into our heart, we're going to produce that kind of problems. Divorce, suicide, all kinds of stuff, folks. I would rather put God's word in my heart. So he says, put them in the, in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all of their flesh. Keep your eyes, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issue of life. Jesus is just simply saying that your heart is the most important thing to know what is in it and the capabilities of it. That is the soil. So the seed of God is very important that we put those things in there. Amen. I want, I typed up some other notes, other passages on the heart because I teach on it a lot. But listen to this. 
For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, and adulteries. We read that. Whatever you do, work with it with all your heart as working unto the Lord and not unto men. Jeremiah 17 says this. He says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed is the man that trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. Those uh, who, whose heart departs from the Lord. So he's saying, cursed is the man that puts his strength and his trust and his heart in the things of man. He says, for he shall be like a, a shrub in the desert and shall, be, and shall not see good when it comes, but shall inhabit the parched areas, places in the wilderness, in the salt land, which is not inhabited. But verse 7 says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the rivers and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will he cease from yielding fruit. And I read all that to read verse 9 of Jeremiah 17. It says this, The heart is deceitful and wicked above all things, and who can know it? He says, I, the Lord, search the heart and I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruits of his doing. The ultimate grace is undeserving, unmerited favor. If God was to give me what was in my heart when I first started walking with him and I felt his hand, I was trying to come with him and I was confused, it would be very bad. And I would venture to say every one of us in here would be the same. We've all done bad things. We've all sinned. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus is the only man that walked on this earth in perfection and holiness. The Bible calls us to be holy. Be ye holy as your Father is holy. And I know when I was rodeoing, rodeo they would come back and say, Scott is a Jesus freak, and he's got into this Jesus stuff. And so there was a sense of persecution by trying to live a pure and clean life to my Father. And you had to uphold that to stand your ground and to walk that out. And I don't know if anybody in here who I'm talking to has ever been persecuted or, or given up and said, it's just not worth it. You know, everybody in the world is doing it. I'm just going to do it too. Well, my philosophy is any dead fish can float downstream. Amen? We should be a live salmon going upstream and fighting the current. Because the end of the book is not totally here yet, but we know in the end of God's word, we win. And I want to be on a winning team, and I want to live on victory, in victory, on my time on earth. Because when we get to heaven, folks, that's where we get rewarded for the life that we've lived here. And there's a lot of people that don't even know Jesus across the street from your ranch, at the cubicle at your office, at the water fountain in your uh, job that you go to, or at the gas station. And I think it's important that we learn how to be used of God and to recognize what's in our heart. I was putting wrong data in my heart, and I was getting bad results. When I got committed to God, God got committed to me, and things began to happen in my life. The life I live today, I now live in Christ Jesus. Scott in the flesh died in that defining moment, and I realized I don't want to miss heaven but I want to be an effective Christian while I'm here on earth. And I challenge every one of us in here, my brothers and sisters, to be strong in everything that we do for God and to be ready to do these things. Amen? Read a little bit more here for us. Fill your heart with the things of God, and out of the treasures you will bring forth success in every area of your life. Let me just show you the opposite of what would be in your heart and the works of the flesh because it was the works of the flesh that I was recognizing that I was producing in my life and there's verses and statements in here that scared me enough to help me to get right with God as, as when that time came. Galatians 5, chapter 5 of Galatians says this in verse 16. It says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary uh, to one to another, so that they do not do the things that so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. 
Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are, and this is where it sounded like me and my traveling partners and everybody else that was rodeoing, but it talks about adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, um, idolatry, scorched, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, rivalries, and of the such of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in the time past that those who practice these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. One day, like Paul on the road to Damascus, the scales came off of my eyes and I realized if I'm doing these things, I'm not going to heaven. And I promise you that all of us in the flesh that live on this earth have done some similar things of these things or at least sin and fallen from grace in our life. God knows that. A good example of a man in the Bible is King David when he had all kinds of sins and problems, but the Bible says that he was a man after God's own heart. And I believe it was because he was a worshiper of our Father. He repented quickly. And I promise you, as we repent quickly in our life and we run to the cross rather than running from the cross, we'll find the answers that we need and God will deal with you. Who am I to stand before you to say how God will deal with you? I just know that he will deal with you. I know that he'll, uh, if you allow him, he will deal with you in your life because he's a gentleman and he loves you and he gave us free will. He didn't just put us in a, a box and say, here's Scott and pastor and we're just gonna you know, put them in the game of life and he's gonna answer to me and worship me and love me. No, he allows us to discover what his purposes are what his plans are for our life. If God gave you a dream in your heart and you're not operating and moving out in that, is it God's fault that it's not coming to pass? No. It may be our own deception of the enemy holding us up for the fear of not stepping out of the boat or that we think that we don't have what we need and we say, oh God, you know, I need all this stuff and when it's here, I'll do it. I want to encourage you today, whatever God's put in your heart, good and bad. The bad things, separate that, address it, call it by name, stand on it, and ask forgiveness from your heavenly Father. And he promises us in his word that he would forgive you. Amen. And then if there's things that we need from God to do what he's called us to do, believe God. I need a million dollars to start this business. What is a million dollars to the man who owns the cattle on a thousand hills? Amen. It's all his. I have to learn how to transfer what he made me steward over back to him. Father, thank you. You gave me a wife. You gave me a family. You gave me a career. You gave me a ministry. But it's not my ministry. It's your ministry. When it becomes my ministry, get ready for a fall. Get ready for struggles. Get ready for bumps in the road. He goes on to say in verse 22, he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against such there is no law. He who finds his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake shall find it. Amen. God is so good. It's all about the word and it's all about your heart. And if you're like me, like I said earlier, I was putting negative things into my heart and I was producing negative results. I wasn't, I mean, there was times where you know how it is. Things are going good. You're doing well. But in your heart of heart that you know that you're not excelling in the things of God. And so I want to encourage us tonight that we have time now to get it right before he returns in our life. Because he is going to come back for us. And what will he find us doing? The word of God and the prayer are two sources of spiritual strength in our power. Here's some things. If you're taking notes or just listen to it, things that you can do to strengthen your spiritual walk with God. Read the Word. Speak the Word. Listen to Bible teachings. Read Christian books. Watch Christian programming. Pray in, in the understanding and also go to prayer meetings. Be involved in the things of God. When the church doors are open, come and serve. Many are called, few are chosen. But I believe the ones that are willing to step out are the ones that God is looking for to choose in their life. Amen. The heart. To be a doer of the word and, not a, hear, and, and a hearer of the word only would be to deceive yourself. Do not be deceived, my brethren, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he reap. 
Are we sowing good things in our life or are we sowing negative things? I believe, like I said earlier today, that the, the soul of a man is his mind, his will, and his emotion. And your physical flesh many times leads us astray. So it's our job as Christians to submit or mortify, as we read this morning, to put it in its place. Because the appetite of the flesh is greater than the spirit if you're feeding it more or it's untamed in our life. A man that doesn't have a relationship with God is very similar to, uh, very similar to an animal in the jungle. You just do whatever by, by habit and by creature, you know, the creature of his uh, byproduct of his environment. We just get into the routines of life. So let's put God first in everything that we do. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the, cra the cravings of sinful man, the lust of the eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes from the Father of the world. The world and its desires are passing away, but the man who does the will of God shall live forever. I believe that God simply has given us a choice. Do you want this or do you want that? Bondage and uh, being under the curse all those things. We talked about another thing, generational curses. You need to study these things out and get in the Word as pastor brings the message to you weekly. You need to go home and not only, uh, you know, not hear the Word, but be, in a, be a doer of the Word by breaking it down to where you understand in it and apply it to your life. It has to become action. The process of renewing your mind has the word I-N-G on the end of it. That tells me that it's a continuation. I didn't renew my mind one time in 1995 when I was saved. I renew my mind daily to his word. By the washing of the word, he covers my life. He changes my heart in all that I do. Colossians 3.10 says this, that we are to put on the new man. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above and not on earthly things for he died and your life is hidden in Christ, in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then there will also appear with him, we will also appear with him in glory. Put to death. See, put to death. I said this morning that Jesus already defeated Satan and now he sits at the right hand of the Father praying for us tonight and, and every church throughout the world that we come to his saving grace and his knowledge but there's things that we have to do that he's given us the ability to do in our life it's not the pastor's job to have a prayer life for us to come running forward and have somebody pray for you when God says I need you to pray I need you to confess I need you to believe that God is going to move in on that situation so we cooperate with God and we do the things that God called us to do as his children because Jesus paved the way for us to walk in that victory. Whether it's sickness, Jesus' stripes on his back, there's diseases that are unclassified and uncurable that Jesus has already paid with those whippings on his back for you and I. But we have to take ownership of that and believe that he did it for you talking about putting on the old man so he says put to death therefore whatever belongs to your earthly nature sexual immorality impurities lust evil desires and greed which is idolatry because of these things the wrath of God is coming why is the wrath of God coming because people have a tendency to allow these things in their life God wants them out of your life but he wants us to come to him and his help to help us to remove them when we try to do it under our own effort, we get weary, and we're laborsome, and we're tired, and we give up. And that's where Satan wants us. He wants to isolate us to the island by ourselves, where he can torment us in our own mind, trying to find a way to get ourselves out of the predicament that we've allowed ourselves to get in. Amen? But that's where the renewing of the mind and the change of our heart, the transformation begins to help us. You used to walk, he says, but because of these things, the, the wrath of God is coming. He says, you used to walk in these ways. Scott used to walk in these ways. You and I used to walk in these ways. He says, in the life that you once lived, he says, but now you must rid yourself of such things, such as anger, rage, malice, slander, 
and filthy language far from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old man and its practices. My old man used to love to do a lot of stuff that I'm not proud of. Why? Most of it because I wore that cowboy hat and we were called tough guys, right? We were coming to town to rodeo. Where did I learn that? I learned it from my dad's buddies in the cell barn when I was a little eight-year-old kid. I watched them chew and cuss and fight and talk about things that men talk about. What happened? I was a byproduct of my environment. I grew up, I wanted to be like my heroes. But all that negative thing down in my heart began to produce things that later on I would have to deal with. So like we read in Proverbs 4.20, let's guard our heart with all diligence. Everything, we watch our heart, we put on the, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, and show our feet, and we have the sword of the Spirit and the shield of faith, and we, and we protect that which is valuable in our life. And that's you as a child of God. And maybe that's covering your wife with prayer. Maybe that's your children. Train a child in the way that he will go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. I heard my grandmother praying that, and by gosh, it happened. There was a time that I came to a relationship with God on my own, and I wasn't relying on her prayers, and God dealt with me. He spoke to me, and he put this calling that I'm walking in today in my life. What has he called you to? We must be about it. Amen? You remember when Jesus was 12 years old, and Mary and, and, and Joseph took him to the synagogue, and they left him, and they were like, where's Jesus? Where was he? He was 12 years old talking to the elders. And he was talking with such grace and, and beauty. And they were like, who is this? This child at this age can talk about that. And so God has given us this word. And if we let, allow it to sit on the coffee table and get dust on it. And I used to read it to take stuff out of it because I knew one of my traveling partners was going to ask me, what about this? What about that? And I wasn't walking with God, but I thought, man, I went to school. I can try to find that for you. Hold on. And I would read it to take out of it. And I wasn't getting anywhere spiritually. I wasn't developing my character. But when I got saved, I realized this is my father sitting in my lap, wanting to put his arms around me and hug me in my insecurities, my fears, and be there for me every step of the way. But it seemed like every time I put my Bible over there in my gear bag or in my glove box in my truck, I didn't have the power that I needed to live the way God created me to live. Amen. I know our time is drawing short. I pray that you understand the importance of what I'm talking about to have your heart right in these things. Romans 6 says this, knowing this, that your old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin may be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died and has been freed from sin. Now if he died, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey it and its lusts. Sin has its own lust. My flesh has its own lust. And God calls us to bring it into submission under the authority of Christ Jesus and the blood that he shed at Calvary would cleanse my life and free me from those, those penalties that Jesus um, had in our in our life so so understand that do not uh, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin but present yourselves to God being alive from the dead and your members as instruments to righteousness to God for sin shall not have dominion over you for you are no longer under the law but under grace man that is powerful tr truth you shall know the truth, and the truth that you know will set you free. And I believe with all my heart that God is going to do a powerful work within this church, in this community, and in this state. And I believe, like I said this morning, as strong as we are in our community, the love of God is shed abroad. It just branches out, and it begins to multiply His blessings 
and his favor and the things that you need in your life. Amen. Every one of us in here don't, I don't believe, want to stay where we're at in our relationship with God. And it is vitally important that we grow spiritually so that our character can help us in these situations that we've gotten ourselves into, whether it's our flesh, whether it's our culture, whether it's the enemy. Who are we fighting today? What am I carrying in that all those people spoke negatively over my life and my childhood? I bring that into my adolescence, and then I bring it into my high school years, and then I bring it into my career, and I just seem to have this stronghold that every time I'm walking with God, I get up to this wall, and I can't get over top of that. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3, and 4, uh, 3, 4, and 5, it says that we are to take every thought captive and to make it obedient to the knowledge of God's Word. So when that thought comes to me, where did it come from? How do I take control of it? And is that what God said? Because if I believe this thought more than I believe God's Word, I'm going to begin to produce this kind of harvest in my life. Amen? God can't produce in a, in a stony heart. You can throw those seeds of grain right there on that concrete. It's not going to produce. But when you put it down in your heart, it will begin to produce. Amen? God is so good. He gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. Be strong, be courageous, because you will lead, uh, because you will lead these people. He's talking to Joshua, and I kind of wanted to end with this to tell you that it's going to take courage to do the things that you need to do. He told Joshua in chapter 1, he says, Be strong, be courageous, because you will lead these people into the inherit." Uh, into the land that they inherit and I swore to the forefathers to give them. Be strong and be very courageous. Be careful to obey the laws of my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from them to the left nor to the right that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart out of your mouth but meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything that is written in it that you would be pro prosperous and successful. I want to ask you tonight again, have we been putting God's Word in our heart? And how, what is that producing in our life? As we begin to look at our lives, we begin to understand where, where are we at as we read earlier in the opening devotion, it was talking about how, how they believed back in those days that a person's heart would be a reflection of who they are. God said, where your heart is, there will be your treasure. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. I've been in big meetings in Hollywood and actors, and it just seemed like when somebody walked in the room and they sat down and we were going one way, and all of a sudden this guy comes in and pretty well-to-do man, and he would say something, two or three words, and all of a sudden, my spirit would jump and say, nope, this, we ain't going that way. I promise you, let's stay where we were before he walked in the room, because it's not all about him. And of course, I'm talking about developing content that has a message of God, and God put certain men in the room, and we allowed somebody to step in from the side, and it just went bad. I think you all understand what I'm saying, so let's be diligent about God's business in our life. Amen. Will you stand with me tonight? Man, I tell you, I can tell when God is talking, and it's, I got enough notes up here to choke a Missouri mule, but I love when I speak from my heart, and I hope you guys recognize that, but it's not me speaking. I believe with all my heart God wants to touch marriages. I believe that God wants to touch churches. And I know he wants to touch the heart of men. Men in here are leaders and our wives and our families are helpmates. But when the, when the structure of the way he designed it is put back together, it just works, folks. Nothing else will work the way God designed it in our life. And I promise you, as you're willing to open your heart up to him, he is there. And that he is no respecter of a person. He'll do it whether you're five years old or 60 or 85 years old. But he's waiting for us to take that free will and to break that and say, like Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, not my will be done, but your will be done, Father. 
If you haven't come to that broken place yet, I don't know that God can use any of us. But when we get to the place of brokenness, that's the beginning of where the things of God begin to step in because He begins to take control of the situation in our life. Amen? We're not here to condemn you or to, to point you out or to embarrass you. But I do want to know before we go home tonight that we're saved. I've heard the gospel tonight. And I believe with all my heart that your word and what I've heard Scott say and what you did in his life, I want that too. What you've done in pastor's life. God set it in motion and he doesn't go back and change what he's doing for some to adjust it to fit your lifestyle. He is God. He created it all. So we have to. Can you imagine what it must have been like Jesus to be whipped at that post? His flesh literally ripped from his back. His beard plucked to the point of not recognizing him. Nailing his hands and his feet to that cross. He did that for your sin and for my sin. When he did that and he died that death, I want to have everything that is available to me that he died so that I could have. Amen? I'm not talking about naming and claiming it. I'm talking about being courageous and following the word of God, putting it in my heart and watching the principles of God lead the character of my life so that when I get to that journey at the end, I can look at my master and say, Father, thank you. We did it together. You helped me overcome these things in my life. All kinds of problems in our world. The world says, here, just take this pill. Just go see this psychiatrist. You need this, you need this, you need this, you need this. None of it. And although I'm not condemning modern science and medicine, but what I am condemning is the fact that we, we turn to that instead of going to our Father and saying, Lord, what would you have us to do? We're coming to you right now. Tell us what to do. And I know he's looking down from heaven tonight and he's saying, I know what's in your heart and I'm willing to help you, but we have to ask him. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, right now I come before my church family. I thank you, Father, for your word that it is powerful. Lord, you have done everything very purposely in our life. And Father, right now, if there is anybody in this room, in the sound of my voice, that has never made Jesus the Lord of their life, I pray for them and with them right now. Father, I believe that it's important that we walk in unity and harmony with you. And these things that stand between us, Father, that separate us, because you're not where those things are, Father, we have allowed ourselves to be derailed, to be distracted, and to be hindered from the race that you have called us. And so, Father, tonight we believe and admit that we are sinners and that we have been lost without you. And, Father, that we need you. And we ask that you fill our hearts, Father. You give us that transformation, that transplant from a stony heart to a fleshly heart. And, Father, that we would nurture it as a good steward to put the things in it with your help from your Holy Spirit to guide our life, Father. We thank you, Lord, for this. And right now, with every head bowed, I would ask you, will you pray the sinner's prayer with me this way? Say this. Say, Jesus, everyone in here, Jesus, I ask you right now to forgive me of my former ways, of my flesh. I've heard your word, and I need you in my heart. Come into me right now. I believe that you are God. I believe that you sent your son. I believe you raised him from the dead. And now, Father, I will be yours. Help me to forgive those that have harmed me, that have wronged me. Father, that is my deepest desire to walk with you. May your spirit guide my life every day. Help me to see myself the way you see me 
the way you designed my life and the way you created me with purpose, with destiny and fulfillment. For you alone are my answer. And I give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.